So yeah, good afternoon to everyone. At the outset, I wish wish you all a very happy World Snake Day. It's a great uh, thing that we have all gathered today for this uh, particular occasion. We are delighted to have our speakers today with us who have worked their life for the cause of conserving snakes and also changing the attitude of public towards this beautiful and amazing species. At the outset, I welcome Sri Pratip Kumar, PCCF Hof and Chief Wildlife Warden of Andhra Pradesh. Sri Romulus Vitekar, Padma Shri and Indian her Herpetologist and Conservationist. Dr. Abhijit Das from Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun. Sri KLN Murthy from Eastern Ghats Welfare Society. Sri Gyaneshwar from Wildlife Conservation through Training and Education. And Mr. Ajay Karthik from uh, Madras Crocodile Bank Trust. We also have with us uh, our Conservator of Forest, Sri uh, P. Ramon Rao, sir. Uh, our conservator of forests, Vishakha Patna. So he's been giving us support to host this webinar. Our audience today are a group of people in the field of conservation, the students from various colleges and schools, the youth interested in the field of wildlife and its conservation, the ACF trainees from CASFOS Coimbatore, officers from the forest department, and many more such people. So basically, we have a wide group of audience today. Actually, Regarding snake conservation, if I speak, I strongly believe that changing the negative perception and attitude towards the snake is the most important aspect which we need to work upon. And uh, I can say it with much pride that that is the main focus which has already been for the forest department as well as the various uh, non-governmental organizations and various other government institutes also which have been working upon this particular aspect of the conservation. So. Uh, this is basically the aim of this webinar as well, that we create as much awareness about the snakes as possible so that there is minimum fear and negative perception about these amazing species. So without much further ado, I would now like to request Sri Pratip Kumar sir, our PCCF and Hof and Chief Wildlife Warden to address the gathering and give the opening remarks. Actually, sir is one such officer who takes quick decisions and has been very positive about any new ideas or innovation which would aim towards the conservation of any species. So please take this opportunity to have an interaction with them. Now I would request sir to please give his opening remarks. <coughs> Thank you Nandani. Hope I am audible to everyone. Yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for the nice words. And uh, thanks for the brief introduction. And uh, once again, I welcome all the participants and, uh, the, guest, and, and the guest speakers, particularly Padmashri Ramulas Vitekar, uh, Mr. Abhijit Das from Wildlife Institute of India, Mr. Murthy Kantimahanti from uh, Eastern Guards Wildlife Society, Vishakapatnam, Mr. Ganeshwar, and Mr. Ajay Karthik from MCBT. And uh, all the participants uh, who are taking part in the, this webinar. And uh, first of all, let me uh, congratulate and thank Mr. Ram Mohan Rao, the conservator of forest Vishakapatna, and the curator Indira Gandhi Geological Park, Mrs. Nandani Salaria, for, uh, uh, for their initiative in uh, organizing a webinar on uh, this World Snakes Day. On a regular basis, we, we celebrate, you know, uh, on the other day, I think 14th or 15th, we had uh, World Chimpanzee Day. But this this particular day is very, very important, you know, which we are celebrating or which uh, as World Chimpanzee Day. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unlike other species in the biodiversity, uh, snakes are very, very unfortunate, you know, that, you know, uh, the majority of them are non-venomous or non-poisonous. Still, that fear among people is there, including me. When, uh, though I'm, I'm in forest department, I have been in the forest department for the last 34 years. Though I know many of them, except a few are uh, non-poisonous, uh, the, the very sight of it uh, creates some fear. Uh, this is, this is uh, very, very common. Uh, also. And uh, that's really unfortunate. You know, that results in, you know, uh, snakes uh, for 
and I, I, I really appreciate the initiative taken. Uh, I hope this will create a lot of awareness among uh, the people who are participating and request all the people who are participating to spread this message that you know all these snakes are not dangerous, all these snakes are not venomous. Uh, if you look at the literature around, I think more than three, 300 uh, species of snakes are available uh, in India. And you know, in our eastern ghats, particularly in the northern part of Andhra Pradesh, like East Men, Srikakulam, Vijayanagar, Vishakapatnam, uh, we have uh, a lot of areas where you know the, the fascinating king cobra is available. But you know, the, the, the problem is you know, uh, majority of poisonous, only four cry, only four snakes, like you know, the spectacled uh, cobra or Russell Piper, some four are you know. Uh, which account for majority of the deaths in the in the country or in the state. So the, the problem before us is to create awareness actually, unless there is awareness among the people that you know all these snake species are not uh, venomous or poisonous. This problem is going to persist and this problem is going to continue. So what is the way forward to address this uh, uh, problem? Because you know snakes are a part of the biodiversity, unlike other species. So their presence in the ecosystem or in the biodiversity is very, very important. And you know, you know very well in the farmers' fields, you know, they are the they are the uh, species which put the rodent population under control. Otherwise, an enormous damage would happen to the crops we raise. And another thing is the farming community. The people uh, who, who work in the fields, they are the people who really come across snakes and you know they are the victims of snake bites. <coughs> the only <coughs> the, the remedy or the solution for this malady is creating awareness, identifying the snake rescuers. We don't call them snake catchers, snake rescuers or snake charmers. And making uh, a direct to those people available to the people available to the people. So this is very very important. And uh, unlike uh, unlike like other uh, other other uh, wildlife uh, uh, which are affected uh, in nature, you know, like you know species uh, like uh, habitat loss, climate change, diseases. Lack of awareness, as I already told you, and the commercial angle to the snake skin, you know, you know, I mean, uh, uh, some purses and handbags they are made of, you know, snake skins, which which is a lot of value. So these kind of things, and you know, uh, blind beliefs. So they are they are coming in the way, and you know that is resulting in uh, uh, snake kills. So like uh, uh, pan animal conflict, the snake human conflict has to be addressed with the involvement of the people in forest department, the non-governmental organizations, and the public. So this is very, very important. Uh, in this direction, uh, I, I remember Mr. Rahul Pandey is sitting with me. He's our CC of Wildlife. Uh, there was a proposal from the field <clears throat> to have a tripartite agreement with uh, one NGO based in Vishakapatnam. Uh, Eastern Gods Wildlife Society, Mr. Kanti Mohanty Murthy is available, and uh, the the other party would be the Forest Department, and the technical collaboration, the technical advice will be from the Madras Crocodile Bank Bank Trust, wherein uh, Padmashri uh, Ramulas Vitaker will be with us in guiding the uh, department and the NGOs. So, as a proposal, uh, the, the financial support and the logistics will be provided by the forest department. And uh, to start with, as a pilot, it will be done in uh, the north coastal Andhra Pradesh, covering Shikakulam, Vijayanagaram, Vishakapatnam. Uh, in some places like Chodavaram and in Vijayanagaram, some Dugeru and uh, like Sitampeta areas, where uh, this, this, this problem is you know, persisting. Uh, now, the need of the hour is not to keep it as a proposal, to put it onto the tracks. So immediately, whatever financial uh, requirement is there, uh, to start with as a pilot, uh, marking this uh, 
World Snake Day in 2020. We will be establishing a facility in those three centers with uh, the financial support from the Forest Department and technical collaboration with uh, uh, Madras uh, Crocodile Bank Trust and uh, Eastern, Eastern Gods Wildlife Society, Mr. Kanti Mohanty. I think that will set the ball rolling. And once you know we, we understand the efficacy or uh, uh, effectiveness of this, uh, this kind of a tripartite agreement to handle uh, this uh, snake-human conflict, maybe we can extend this kind of facility to other districts or other, 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 other parts of the state. Uh, this is in brief, and uh, because, you know, uh, uh, as an administrator, you know, I can I can go on uh, saying certain things, but you know, I was told that the time given to us is one one hour or one hour fifteen minutes. Uh, we will be more interested in listening to the experts, experts particularly Padmashri uh, uh, Ramala Switaker. I think I was told he has got a very limited time to participate today, and the other experts Abhijit uh, Das and other people. Uh, as a part of this tripartite agreement, the, the essence of the agreement would be to have a facility at some places. We'll have the list of uh, uh, snake rescuers and awareness trainings at these places. And, you know, in case an emergency, there is a call that, you know, some snake entered into some, some house or, you know, somebody has to catch it. You know, the people should be available to handle uh, those kind of situations. Uh, like, you know, one more thing will be like in the helpline, helpline numbers. And again, sensitizing the forest department staff, and all those things will be discussed at length in the days to come. The final, I would say that community outreach, the participatory approach, public education, and institutional capacity building. These four are very, very important in handling any conflict, and specifically the snake and human conflict. With this, I end, and I will be more interested uh, to listen to the experts who are participating in the webinar. Thank you very much. Once again, I appreciate the initiative taken by the curator uh, IGJP Vishakapatnam and the conservator of forest Vishakapatnam and the chief conservator of forest uh, wildlife from the headquarters, Mr. Rahul Pandey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It was indeed an apt message for the day as well as uh, such positive steps towards the conservation in a holistic manner would definitely yield great results for us. So we t we today have a special guest with us. Already I've mentioned Sri Romulus Whitaker, who's a Padma Shri awardee, uh, Indian herp herpetologist, conservationist. He's a founder of Madras Snake Park, a Madras uh, Crocodile Bank Trust, and I have to list many more things. There are many more, a uh, lot of awards in his name. So I would actually fall uh, short of time and words if I have to describe about him as well as his work. So. Uh, Please do read about his work as well as see his videos on internet, which will give us uh, awareness about how to deal with the uh, snakes as well as how to be uh, take precautions when uh, we are in an area where snakes could be around. So which will actually help in minimizing the human snake conflict, which is actually not a conflict. So that has been created by us only. So that would definitely help us in uh, making ourselves aware and uh, educated about the same. So. Let's but, uh, just hear him now. Sir, uh, if we put it on uh, YouTube, it will start Thanks, echoing, everyone. sir. And so thank you, Dr. if somebody Sabaria is putting out it on Shri YouTube, Pradeep let Kumar it be on mute, for sir. For inviting me to join you virtually Sorry. in Vice Egg on World Snake Day. India has the dubious reputation of being the snake bite capital of the world with over 50,000 deaths each year and most of them farmers and their families. Let me just come on like The Madras Crocodile Bank, much along much. with our regional partners, is sure that we can reduce snake bite by teaching people the true facts about snakes. Which ones are venomous? How to avoid them? And what to do if bitten? The best way to get this information out to villages in India is by showing people the short videos in Telugu that we have produced. Please email us to snakebite at the rate of madrascrocodilebank.org or ask our friend Murthy of the Eastern Ghats Wildlife Society who is based right there with you. 
Snakes are an essential and valuable component of our ecology. I think so. There is some issue with his uh, internet connection. We also do have a recorded video of uh, Mr. Whitaker for safety purpose. So uh, he stays in a village near Chennai, so where he was having uh, some issues with internet. So he was skeptical about it. So he already sent us a video, recorded video with his message in it. So maybe we'll play that. He's having some issue with the internet. There's only one cure for venomous snake bite, and that is antivenom. If someone is bitten, do not waste time. Get them to a hospital or clinic with antivenom as soon as possible. Please be prepared. Find out the nearest source of medical treatment with antivenom. Now watch these video clips to show. Greetings, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Salaria and Sri Pratip Kumar for inviting me to join you virtually in Vice Egg on World Snake Day. India has the dubious reputation of being the snake bite capital of the world with over 50,000 deaths each year, and most of them farmers and their families. The Madras Crocodile Bank, along with our regional partners, is sure that we can reduce snake bite by teaching people the true facts about snakes, which ones are venomous, how to avoid them, and what to do if bitten. The best way to get this information out to villages in India is by showing people the short videos in Telugu that we have produced. Please email us to snakebite at the rate of madrascrocodilebank.org or ask our friend Murthy of the Eastern Ghats Wildlife Society, who is based right there with you. Snakes are an essential and valuable component of our ecology. They are the best rodent controllers in the world. Only a few species of venomous, and all they want to do is to avoid humans. Using a light at night when a lot of bites happen, sleeping on a cot and using a mosquito net are all ways to avoid snake bites. Farmers need to practice snake safe planting and harvesting, watching where they put their hands and feet. There's only one cure for venomous snake bites. The video bites is getting streamed on the YouTube, sir. We are trying so to share the screen in this as well. So at Get both the places, it's uh, pretty not possible. So. Possible. That's the problem. Please be prepared. But the message Find is going on, sir, in the YouTube streaming, so we can play it there, there as well. Now watch these video clips to show that snakes really don't want to bite you. These clips were shot at over 1,000 frames per second, greatly slowing down the action. First is the Russell's Viper. When someone foolishly walks around without a light at night, he or she may step on the viper. Here you see that the snake is very frightened and only wants to escape. When stepped on, the viper feels in danger of its life. And if it bites and injects venom, the patient must get to a hospital for antivenom without delay. And now we're going to show you the cobra. to show you the cobra. This is how it uses its sensitive tongue. And this is actually showing the inside view of venom extraction. The venom flows out of its fangs like water from a tap. Then we wanted to see how a cobra strikes and bites. Though the artificial leg was an obvious threat to the snake, time after time, the cobra spread its hood to frighten the intruder, and in every case, the cobra struck with its mouth closed. If actually stepped upon or grabbed, a cobra may bite, but when it strikes from an upright position, it keeps its mouth closed. It just wants to frighten you away, and it works. There's lots more to learn about these fascinating reptiles, and a bit later, Ajay Karthik of the Madras Crocodile Bank is going to show you the big four venomous snakes of India. So happy snake day to all of you and keep safe and happy.
Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. It was a very interesting way of putting across your message. Although we had certain te technical glitches about the internet, but uh, thank you very much. Our next speaker today is Dr. Abhijit Das, who is a scientist from Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun. His pa passion is basically herpetofauna, and he wishes to initiate herpetofaunal inventory. I'm sure he must have already worked out about it. And the monitoring uh, programs for this. Sorry for that. Uh, monitoring programs for the same. Basically, an experience of a field visit with him is always a memorable one in the sense that there will be a lot of learning. And at the end of the day, we would uh, learn about the diversity as well as the endemism of the herb petofauna, which will be found in our surrounding areas only. So there will be nothing as such about it, but you'll end up find, finding something new about it. So yeah, over to you, Dr. Abhijit. Thank you, Dr. Nandini. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I, I can hear you clearly. Okay, let me share my screen. Yeah. So, uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes, your screen is being shared. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me in this talk. And um, I really uh, appreciate that and also the effort of the Forest Department of Andhra Pradesh for organizing this event. And um, it's, it's a great way. And uh, I really thankful to all of you to, uh, for, for inviting me in this. But uh, let me start with uh, this because this event could not have been better than organizing by, organized by uh, your place that is Vishakapatnam from where the study of Indian snake actually started. So in this slide, you actually can see uh, a photograph, a picture of Patrick Russell, who first came to India in a place we know as Vishakapatnam. And he is the one who is first who wrote two volumes on Indian snake based on his hand painting drawings of Indian snake. And he is the one pioneer who actually also experiment, experimented with the venoms of Indian snakes. So he is arguably considered as the father of Indian ophiology. And we have just heard somebody who is also known as the, you know, the snake man of India. So it's a great uh, setting for for me to start with in this context. So we are today, we must, must uh, feel like a day of Jurassic period because at the time when snake evolved almost like 250 million and before that, when snake evolved in this world. And in this slide, you see that there are different types of reptiles that we all know. And what are those reptiles that any child can say is that crocodiles, turtles, lizards and snakes and you know the one and one of their ancestor who got extinct from their world that is dinosaur but for an evolutionary biologist reptiles are not that easy to define because if you see the phylogeny of the reptiles birds also come within the reptile group so crocodiles are more closely related to birds than any other reptiles similarly turtles which is almost 200 million old lineage are very, very distinct from the recently recent lineages of reptiles, these are lizards and snakes. And the numbers that you see inside these figures are the species diversity in this group currently known. So there are a few crocodiles and we have an example of Gharial, a living fossil. But when we talk about reptiles, there is a problem in understanding them. Okay, they are very different from mammals. But today, in this day of snake day, I should vouch for snakes because they are no less than uh, mammals and birds. Although we appreciate mammals and birds more, but because we do not know the life history of reptiles. The basic life history of reptiles goes into what we call as ectothermy. That is the way they live they take the heat from their environment. So they are not endothermic animals because so that you know they are dependent completely on their environment to maintain their body temperature. Although in an evolutionary framework, it looks like 
this is a evolutionary disadvantage but it is all actually not true first reason for that is that if it is is an evolutionary disadvantage then there would not have been so many reptiles which you see something like you know 6000 species of lizard and more than 3500 species of snakes so they are evolutionarily successful group second thing is that because their metabolism is so less they almost one tenth of a mammal or a bird so because of their less metabolism their maintenance cost is very very less so they operate in an environment which other animals cannot operate if there is a winter period mammals and birds need to migrate but snakes just shut down their metabolic activity and go for hibernation so that's a very tremendous um, life history strategy which enables reptiles to inhabit in inhospitable places where mammals and birds cannot survive for example some 300 species of lizards and snakes that occupy scratching desert and marine environment where snakes uh, where mammals cannot live so they are not evolutionary dis disadvantages if we can if we compare mammals with car the high maintenance cost um, thing then real reptiles can be compared with a bicycle less maintenance cost in their lifestyle but one thing is that all of them are poorly known largely because we hardly can understand their life history strategy and the most poorly known is what we call as snakes snakes are very very specialized animal they are bodies very very simple just like a pipe but they are they have specialized in a, in such a way they can live in any kind of habitat for example they can swim they can climb they can glide they can go underneath soil so these are some remarkable adaptations that snake has made for example the simple bifid tongue with which it senses the environment so with each flick of tongue snake actually sample its environment twice so it also gives the direction in which the snake should move if there is more chemical uh, signal from the right side of the tongue then the snake will move towards the right side that's a remarkable strategy in case of snakes they have a lot of specialization like they do not have limbs eyelids or are ear opening they have whole sets of chemical communications and they are most poorly understood and does they are probably the nature's best kept secret so far if we want to understand snake we need to know the diversity that we have currently in our country and in the world so the most primitive snakes in this group are blind snakes they are they are can be differentiated by no differentiation between the scales of the back side and also the belly scales almost like a lizard trait their eyes are hidden under scales and they have a very large shield which on their head which helps them propel under soil the tail which is like a small spine helps them to propel their body forward okay so this primitive snake almost 300 species in the world is actually most poorly understood and currently there is no study which actually see the larger picture of the taxonomy because it's a very complex topic to deal with so they are most primitive snakes evolved almost 150 million year ago and still there in our world but if we consider the most advanced snakes then we can see a picture like this a snake whose body is covered by scales which are the modification of epidermal layer of their skin and the skins are the skin having the scales are arranged in rows okay so as today our also um, target groups are students and researchers so i can tell them that you know there are opportunities to review say how many rows of scales of snakes are there in our country and how these rows of scales are related to food because it has been found that the rows of scales are not random but it is related to the food item they eat so a larger a snake that eats larger prey for example python that has more number of rows of scale along the body than a, a snake that feeds on frogs which has 17 or 13 rows of scales 
so these are very very unique adaptations for snakes so they have these dorsal scales on their body and the outer most layer of their skin gets changed every year we know the process as ichthyosis and that is very very important even for from captive breeding purpose also because a healthy snake will molt many times in a year or a small snake will change its skin many time a year and if a snake is not able to change its skin that means the snake is not healthy so these are small simple things that we can take out from their life history strategies if you see the ventral side of the snake if you see those black dots these black dots are the ventral scales which roughly corresponds to the number of vertebrae a snake has and the red dots that you see are the scales below the tail region or called as subcaudals and they have their reproductive organ hidden in in two pockets along the tail two side of the tail so male snakes generally have a longer tail right so these are certain things you need to know if you want to know more about snakes at the basic taxonomical thing but today many of the snakes are getting killed or you know although india has 300 or species of snake on of which only uh, 60 species are venomous but most of the snakes are getting killed because they are not misunderstood they are misunderstood and they are not identified properly so to identify snake what are the things that we need to do we need to dis distinguish between various patterns that they carry in their body for example if you see these two snakes they have long stripes on their body so stripes if you have a long striped snake in your area you should be you should be knowing that this snake most likely it's a non venomous snake and in india most of the snake except few in southern india uh, ha that has a long stripe most of them are non venomous okay so this dorso lateral stripe or lateral stripes these are very very important aspect to understand non venomous snakes some snakes may have bands so bands what kind of bands they carry for example in this snake if you see there are irregular bands on their body some snake may have a very uh, even even sized bands on their body some snakes may carry blotches for example the venomous russell's viper which has very even num even blotches in their body and which may superficially look similar to a common sand boa but then sand boa blotches are very irregular in shape and if you see the shape of the head which is not distinct in sand boa and in distinct in viper you can actually differentiate between a russell viper and sand boa and evade an accident similarly some snakes non venomous snake mimic venomous species like crate which is dangerously venomous species and have potent neurotoxic venom but crate is shiny black with milky white narrow bands so these are the small distinctions that you need to make they are not difficult if you just look at them carefully you can find out but the wolf snake which mimics a crate that has broken bands and many of them are yellowish in color so these are certain things that you can know snake better okay some of the sometimes the scale give you a clue for example the cobra scale if you see her imbricate okay so the imbricate scale means they are overlapped with each other like a tiles okay so if you see a molted skin in your house and you cannot identify whether it is a cobra or a rat snake you can see the shape of the scale in case of cobra the shape of the scale is almost like a rice grain size but in case of rat snake which is non venomous they have rhombus shape almost equal size scale so that is non venomous but cobra skin is the scales are elongated more similarly there are a lot of keeled scale snake that we can identify by observing their skin properly so these are simple clue to identify snakes in the uh, and you know do better for them however if you want to go little detail there are scales in their head that are very very critical for identifying species of youngster who want to study snake they must need to study the scales for example the snake that burrow has a very large rostral scales or the snakes that are non venomous have mostly carry a loreal scale a small scale in front of their eye which is lacking in its similarly looking venomous species like a crate so these are closer look which is informative
but some of the snake has got zenith of evolution and these are pit vipers pit viper has a l'oreal pit which which is essential for making a thermal image of the prey from almost one meter distance and this pit organ is supplied with tremendous number of fiber, no, nerve fibers that actually help snake make a image of the prey or a predator from a distance so no other animal can do it so better than a pit viper okay so these are certain things that we can look for and identify in case of python they have labial pits however in case of snakes studies are very less most of the studies are taxonomic but because students are also involved i would want them to take up the ecological studies in snake which is almost zero we do not have population data for most of the species even for the largest one like python we do not know how a snake feed what is their feeding yield we do not know the movement ecology how for a snake move for that because snake has a sec secretive life we need specialized technique like radio telemetry or pit tags but for still you can do that if you collaborate with good, good institution but these are the gray area in snake science population studies can be done there are a lot of snakes that carry distinct pattern on their body for example python who get rescued many times if you just photograph the python it can be identified just like tigers you identified because each blotches in python is different and if you are forest area getting a lot of python rescue please keep a photo library of the python so that you can identify whether the same snake is getting rescued or you are getting different species there are also skill uh, scale clipping techniques of the ventral scales by which you can identify many thousand snakes okay so these are very easy way to identify individual snakes and to do a mark recapture study on snakes which is completely lacking in our area there are a lot of behavioral research can be done for example there are many snakes where female is very large male is very small large female body size is an evolutionary advantage because a larger female can lay more eggs she can give deliver better babies larger babies so they there is an advantage for that but larger baby body means you are also exposed to predators similarly a smaller body snake will hide themselves very efficiently but the mating success may not occur properly but there are certain snakes where they have combat dance or combat dance means two males fight together to get access of female and in those snakes there are uh, males which are larger than female and we know that there is our majestic species like king cobra they do that so this kind of behavioral research is not done in our country and these are open subject to do conduct our research and that's where leads us to the most elegant and efficient, uh, efficient and special snake of india that is king cobra the large, longest venomous snake which makes a mound nest the only reptile that make a mound nest are is a saltwater crocodile we do not know why a king cobra make a nest but what we are studying now in our uttarakhand state is that what are the different materials they use uh, for nest making because in northeast india they are making nest with bamboo leaves in uttarakhand they are making nest with pine needles do they vary the height and size of the nest according to the temperature regime that is available in different areas so this is one snake that shows that eggs should be protected from external environment okay and that's probably one of the dishes this is an in snake that lead to what is called ovo viviparity or viviparity so snake is one such organism by which the life bearing animals have probably evolved in our in this world so that's why in india we have almost 59 species of oviparous snakes that lay eggs and almost 28 percent of the snakes which are give direct life birth to their offspring for example the large number of vipers and large which live many of them live in higher elevation areas and a large number of snakes that burrows like europeltis they are known to lay direct birth to their offspring so these are certain things that can be taken up for research work there are a lot of conservation issue in fact india is one country which is the most comprehensive snake conservation program all of our snake is protected 
uh, if you see there are a lot of changes in the name of snakes uh, recently there are genus and species has been changed but i have kept it exactly as following wildlife protection act because we we need to follow wildlife protection act exactly uh, otherwise there may be other issues so that's what is the uh, the changes here but what i wanted to say that we have scheduled one species we have scheduled two species and we all other snakes are scheduled four but the problem here comes is that from iucn status because of the last study there are only most of our indian snakes are either not evaluated or considered as data deficient so that's a very big problem we do not know how our snakes are doing the majority of them are unknown that is not not evaluated and data deficient so there is a lot of research opportunity for students and researcher in this field well for reptile conservation we must move into what is called unconventional conservation because if you see this habitat in andhra pradesh they looks mostly barren there is not many mammals and birds in those area but then there are some specialized reptiles for example the small lizard which is endemic to andhra pradesh and also in the similar habitat you have polubar bolanati or the nagarjun sagar racer snake which is endemic to that area so what i wanted to say is that uh we must have to protect those special habitat for to save our special reptiles because they may not be doing they may be there in protected area but some of the species are also hanging out in some of the area which are not protected and in case of reptiles because their movement is very less the gene flow in a within a population is also very less that makes them the you know sub populations are very very vulnerable to extinction so that's why snake uh, conservation or in 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 a, as a whole reptile conservation needs specialized site specific conservation effort and that is what my message to everybody that they are fantastic animal to look for thank you very much for your patience hearing thank you dr abhijit it was indeed a wonderful uh, presentation having all the academic details as well as giving a con message of conservation that to an un unconventional conservation as you very well uh, rightly pointed out uh, so it is always great listening to you thank you very much now we have with us uh, shri kln murthy a herpetologist conservation biologist and the founder of eastern ghats welfare society actually this society has been doing a lot of workshops with the department a lot of snake rescues and awareness programs in the surrounding and in the areas of coastal andhra pradesh uh, so we have a lot to do with them we will be doing a lot of work with them in future as well so over to you mr murthy thank you ma'am uh can everyone hear me i can see abhijit everyone sir can is... hear you murti but uh, we can't see you right, right. Okay. yeah <clears throat> right we have you are visible yeah uh, i'm looking for an option where i can present it still shows abhijit sir is presenting You have an option of present now, I guess. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um. Okay. Can you see my presentation now? Not yet. It's coming. Yes. Now? Yeah. Yeah. Make it full screen. And you're good to go. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my special thanks to PCCF sir, CCF sirs, and uh, curator ma'am for organizing this amazing webinar on snakes. Uh, thanks to forest department. They have been super supportive for all our activities. Now. Um, now uh, the, this webinar is really important because it sheds light on some of the most misunderstood animals uh, across the world and their snakes so uh, <clears throat> just to uh, look at the eastern ghats ranges uh, they are uh, a discontinuous patch of hill ranges which are spread across five uh, 
Indian states along the east coast of India. Um, king cobras, they are the largest venomous snakes in the world. Um, but despite their size, they are pretty much shy and afraid of humans. Uh, they always try to escape given a chance. Um, they are found in different habitat types, also predominantly feed on other snakes. And that makes them very special because uh, they help control the population of other venomous and non-venomous snakes in the area. Uh, so it's also categorized as vulnerable by IUCN. It's also protected under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Now, uh, I heard about king cobras back in 1998 my, when my uncle was working at Wysak Zoo as an educator. And uh, my senior colleague, Mr. Rajkumar, late Rajkumar, uh, who started the Friends of Snakes Society in Hyderabad, also told me that king cobras existed uh, in Vijayanagaram district of Andhra Pradesh back then. And uh, I uh, was always curious about them. And after doing my master's and uh, undergoing some training programs abroad, I came back and started studying them. And incidentally, we found that king cobras are spread across the four districts, pretty much East Godavari, Vishakapatnam, Trikakulam, Vijayanagaram. And uh, we got some good records. Unfortunately, we stumbled across uh, uh, dead specimens but we still had that record of the snake from those locations. We published in some uh, uh, newsletters, as you can see. So these are some of the locality records of king cobras from other districts of uh, Andhra Pradesh. Eastern Guards Wildlife Society is a nonprofit. Uh, we are a grassroots level nonprofit, and uh, we believe engaging multiple stakeholders in conservation of lesser known species like the king cobra or some of the reptiles Abhijit sir was uh, mentioning about uh, is really key because there are charismatic species they get a lot of support fine but then there are also these lesser known species that need protection uh, so these are th these are our uh, team members from Vishakapatnam district alone we have a snake rescue network from other districts of the state as well as from uh, uh, the neighboring state of Odisha. So uh, all these are locally based uh, snake rescuers who can attend, attend a snake rescue if required in no time. So how do we rescue, uh, how do we basically plan our conservation programs uh, saving these king cobras in the Eastern Ghats? So the conservation action planning aimed at reducing the threats to wildlife. This is key. And how do we do that is first by assessing the threats to an animal. Is it habitat specific threats? Is it species specific threats? Threats like what we do address the threats. Um, so these sites, horrific sites, like what you see in this picture is pretty common and it's still there as we speak in uh, pretty much across the country, except in Agumbe or certain sections of uh, uh, Western Ghats. So people kill snakes and king cobra, of course it stands out, it's a big snake and people will kill it looking at it due to fear. Most of it is perceived fear because bites from a king cobra are very rare while thousands of people die from uh, venomous snake bites. Cobra, crate, like PCC have said, crate, we have Russell's wiper, and common cobra. So these guys, king cobras, feed on those big four snakes and uh, they are directly helping our communities. So the thing is to get this message across and one of the main threats, our data also shows that people kill snakes unnecessarily and it's going at an alarming rate. And these reptile populations, as uh, uh, our previous speaker mentioned, they don't move much and they're pretty much vulnerable to local extirpation, if not uh, these threats are not at risk. Um, so this person who is uh, right there uh, holding the tail of the snake to the right side, he assisted the other person in killing the snake. But let me tell you, a month ago, around in the last week of May, that very person who was holding the tail of the snake called us and we could save a huge, bigger than this, for 14 foot king cobra in the same village. So this took us time to reach this level. This was this picture was taken three years ago and we started working there. Um, 
and then uh, the road kills we also documented road kills as one of the main threats but we still don't know we don't have quantifiable data to uh, make any statements so these are potential threats as we know it and disease we have had some uh, king cobras which just died they haven't had any apparent injuries on the body or uh, hit marks uh, wounds nothing so and and as you can see this, this snake is young but it's skinny uh, haven't had food for weeks but we don't know where this is where scientists can actually help us getting these uh, reasons and what kind of diseases these snakes might be facing uh, so generally speaking some general threats like loss of habitat that hampers all the programs that we do and it also endangers not just snakes but several other species of uh, wildlife reduced habitat quality that's because of uh, the uh, exotic plantations and uh, agricultural intensification as you can see uh, in the background it's a pristine king cobra habitat and in the foreground there is this human dominated landscape uh, and it also poor land use management is driving these snakes into human dominated landscapes in search of other snakes for instance rat snakes and cobras they become permanent residents in farmlands because they get plenty of rats and food uh, like shelter so they become permanent residents and king cobras follow other snakes and that's when an encounter is likely to happen now uh, inspiring surrounding communities to take wildlife saving actions it's very difficult to accomplish this because uh, rescuing an animal is just a temporary solution to a bigger problem people are killing snakes because they perceive them as threat their security is at uh, stake and why not as pcc have sir said thousands of them are getting killed so the key is to provide on the ground solutions to these people empathize with them and that's the way to engage them in conservation most of the conservationists today they plan their programs thinking about the welfare of the species they advocate for and uh, without even thinking or you know incorporating the principles and needs of uh, the local communities who share the living space with these deadly animals uh, so our idea is to hit a win win situation where the local communities learn to live harmoniously with king cobras and we have this wildlife on one side people on the other side harmoniously living so it's uh, the the trend has also been changing it's not about conservation in protected areas anymore it's about coexistence because as you know 3 to 4% of uh, india's total geographical area is legally protected and as managers uh, people would know how difficult that is and what about the unprotected areas these human dominated landscapes buffer zones so it's from protection in reserves to harmonious coexistence is what is the trend that's been shifting right now uh so uh i i still remember rom telling me that most king cobras they are very shy they escape but some are really aggressive they stand their ground and attack and this one uh, uh, this 13 foot huge male uh that we rescued from a multiple use area and uh, and uh, released it into a nearby reserve forest gave us uh, a tough time while handling and putting it but still given a chance a snake would always try to escape the idea was to bag it safely without using tongs or any crude methods and uh, release it safely back in the wild away from these areas where humans frequent a lot um so uh, so it all boils down to individual actions whether it's curbing coronavirus or saving snakes individual actions from people individual the local communities the stakeholders the the, the local people so we can only accomplish that with behavior change campaigns and it's not possible in a day or two awareness is excellent it's the first step to start any program but it is going to help when there is no behavior change and uh, so all of our programs we also have this dimension of understanding how best we can uh, tailor a, a, and design our programs to change behavior of human beings and then encourage them to take wildlife friendly actions for instance not killing a snake or leaving it alone or call us you don't have to kill it and it's happening as we can see uh, uh, certain communities in vishakhapatnam where we had been working 
uh, are now not killing king cobras. They are watching them from a distance. They are also sending us photographs and videos of uh, the king cobras leaving, uh, which we feel we really feel happy about it. The increasing tolerance is a very good sign, but there is a long, long way ahead, and uh, this is happening as we speak. Spreading actionable messages. Now, uh, there are uh, very, very specific, specific messages that we would like to uh, convey to our target audience. For instance, this uh, signage, which is at uh, Chodavaram Range Office in Vishakhapatnam, uh, it has a specific purpose. It isn't a conventional educational signage or an awareness board with interesting facts. It has a specific purpose. It only says, if you see a king cobra, don't kill it, call us. And we have the DF force number, the range officer, and our number, so they can call any of these and we'll come and rescue it. So we are always giving a viable, more secure option for the local communities and telling them not to kill snake, but to call us. You don't have to keep the snake. You don't have to kill the snake. Call us, we come and rescue it. So this is our first step towards uh, mitigating the conflict and hitting a harmonious relationship. Um, so Rom uh, and I met in Netherlands a few years ago where he uh, pitched uh, this idea of doing a documentary called Living with King. The Gaia people developed this documentary. It talks about uh, the local communities in the Western Ghats uh, who are uh, able to coexist harmoniously with the King Cobras. And they are basically benefiting from that behavior. They are not afraid of King Cobras. If they see a King Cobra, they call for help and Basically, the venomous snake bite incidents have also reduced in the locality. So it's something what we say as social learning and human behavior. When these local communities are telling their counterparts uh, about the benefits of adopting this behavior, then the chances of adopting the new behavior by the, by the communities in Eastern Guards or elsewhere across the King Cobra range are fairly high because it's their counterparts. It's not a conservationist, it's not some herpetologist saying, but it's one community member conveying the message to another community member. So this you can see on YouTube. You can also hit the link. You can just type living with the king and you'll get the documentary. It's a short film. Um, then institutional capacity building, local community capacity building. More importantly, institutional capacity building. These forest officers, they lay their life on the line to protect these forests. They, they face these dangerous snakes, highly venomous snakes. And so we feel that building their capacity is really important, not for their own personal security, but also to manage snake bites pretty well. As Rom and uh, PCC have sir, mentioned, uh, it's a serious problem and we need more hands on the deck to accomplish that. So we have conducted numerous workshops, training, uh, and this was the idea of uh, the CCF Wildlife Rahul sir to start a uh, training program for all the frontline staff of uh, the forest department on various aspects of snake rescue and uh, snake bite management. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, we are also we have also given this equipment, the snake rescue equipment, to zookeepers and field staff, it, and these resources, field guides, identification guides that they could use back in the field when they go out. Um, and then last year, with the support from the DFO Vishakhapatnam, we had also conducted the first ever uh, King Cobra Conservation Workshop. And that's for field forest officers of the cadre of ACF range officer and all of them. Uh, the basic idea was to sensitize them about King Cobras, the benefits of having them around, and the fact that they're very shy snake and the bites from King Cobras are really rare. So, uh, so most of them, like from four to five districts along the coastal Andhra Pradesh, uh, forest officers have attended it. They benefited from the materials, the films we have shown, the presentations and inputs. Uh, well, that isn't uh, a real king cobra. It's uh, a depiction of a king cobra nest that our team conceptualized for uh, the Vijayanagaram Forest Division, because the idea, as Abhijit sir said, it's a unique snake, perhaps the only snake in the world that builds a nest. And uh, we, we also specialize in doing such 3D models and dioramas that show, that talk about local wildlife and uh, interesting facts about uh, the, the wildlife, the lesser known wildlife, especially, and the importance of uh, saving these amazing animals. So, 
And we always work with the best. Uh, as you can see, Rom Viteker visited our uh, field site back in 2018. Uh, we take regular inputs from them. And uh, we, feel, we feel really honored to be working with these people. Uh, just to put a glimpse in 2019, needless to say, corona-free world, we could do a lot of work. Uh, and this is a glimpse of what we did, our impact in uh, 2019 in numbers. You can always look back after the slides. I don't know how much time I still got, but I'm just flipping through. We also work with this. These are all our supporting organizations, local, international as well, and partners. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Stay safe and happy Snake Day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Murthy. It's good to see such young people oriented towards conservation, that too of snakes. It's really good. And we are really uh, fortunate to have you around. And let's work together for the snake conservation. It's actually very important to tap the energy and potential of the young people. And we have such young, uh, young, I mean, conservationists around us who have been doing tremendous work silently or whenever they are being called upon. They do lot of work in the field of conservation that too for species like snakes which are not like tiger charismatic or you can say like tigers and leopards or lions so we have similar uh, such uh, youngster Janeshwar, member trustee of uh, wildlife conservation through research and education and the assistant project coordinator from madras crocodile bank trust Janeshwar, please go ahead with your presentation please Is my presentation visible? Not yet, Ganeshwar. Only you are visible. Uh -huh. You have to present now. You yeah, have to I have to present now. Uh -huh. Yes, I did press that. Vimal, you can do it from your end if you have the presentation. Uh, can you see my screen, Vimal? Uh, now do you see my presentation? Ganeshwar, meanwhile, you can speak. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here today to be speaking in front of you all and uh, sharing this stage with stalwarts of forest management, wildlife conservation, snake conservation, herpetology, and all. Uh, my name is Ganeshwar. I, um, I finished my undergraduation in wildlife biology, and right now I work at the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust as an assistant project coordinator. I'm also a member trustee for a very young organization called the Wildlife Conservation Through Research and Education. Uh, I've, it, the session has been so far quite in informative and uh, it's been a lot of information has been taught to you so far. And with my presentation, I would like to take the prelevance more next level to WISAC only and what I have seen in WISAC and what I have witnessed in WISAC as, as, a, as a person and as a herpetologist. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if I, you can see my screen. It's on the desktop. Yes, that would be great. How is it right now, Vimal? Okay. So I'll be uh, talking very briefly about uh, snake diversity and the snake rescue situation that's happening in Vishakhapatnam. Uh, like I mentioned, it's Ganeshwar. Uh, 
Wysak is a very special place for me. I've been I've, I've been born and brought up here, and I've been learning a lot of stuff from Wysak. And even though I haven't lived a lot of time in Wysak in the past five to six years, every time I come back, it's a new experience. It's something I find new. It's it's solely because it's one of the few places that are not really highly explored. Uh, I would say that Wysak has roughly forty to fifty species of snakes. Uh, I myself have personally seen not more than thirty five species, but I'm sure that there are more than whatever. So far, seen and every day is a new new learning, and I've been learning that from friends and from fellow researchers that there are new distribution records of snakes from our region. Uh, even though there are studies that were done earlier uh, in the last twenty thirty years, it's one of the places that is highly underexplored. It's, I, I believe it's mainly because of its inaccessibility. It's because of the guards. It's it's mainly because of its border tensions and other 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 agency related areas. Uh, the guard section of Vishakhapatnam and some of the border section of Vishakhapatnam are not uh, really explored, and uh, that makes it very special. That makes it very secretive. Something that we always find new whenever we go up the guards or go up, go down or go on on the valleys and all. Uh, there are a diverse range of habitats and uh, hotspots in, in and around Vishakhapatnam that I have witnessed and I have learned from friends. Uh, I'll be showing about a wide range of, I'll, I'll be showing a map of later in my presentation, but just to give you a gist, we have the scrub jungles, we have the dry deciduous forests, we have moist deciduous forests, we have huge valleys of coffee plantations, we have uh, urban landscapes that are still really good for snake habitats. And Wysag is one of the biggest uh, parts of Eastern Ghats, and uh, it has a lot of rarities, I would say, and it has some endemics, which I believe uh, are endemic to either Central India and Eastern India or Eastern Ghats and maybe the rest of the Eastern India. Uh, and there are some more snakes that I would actually like to focus on today. Uh, this, is, this is just a very uh, small, uh, it's just a screenshot of a Wysag map from a Google Satellite Earth. You can see uh, uh, you can see how uh, diverse the uh, landscape is. For example, we have the oceans on the east. We have the Bay of Bengal, which is uh, which is a unique character on to be having uh, on our side. And then we have right after the oceans, we have the plains, the, the scrub jungles, the plateaus, the uh, the urban landscapes, which are again ideal hotspots for snake animals like snakes that thrive on rodents and uh, other small mammals. And not very far from plains is what we have are the ghats. These ghats are, again, I, I believe the highest point we go is about 1500 to 1600 MSL. But uh, the ghats are extraordinar extraordinarily unbelievable because it's not very far from the sea. It's, 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 it's quite close. They're, they're, I, I believe from the ocean uh, to the ghats as a as a crow flies is probably 60 to 70 kilometers only. So in this just 70 kilometers, we have three ranges of three types of uh, landscapes. This this will definitely mean that we have a, a huge diversity of uh, animals in and around us, especially snakes like, like Dr. Abhijit was talking about how snakes have evolved and it's just still a secret. Uh, th these are three. Uh, these three uh, factors indicate that uh, there must be some. There must be more and more that we are not sure of yet. We are not sure what they are available. We are not sure what uh, what lies in our distribution maps and all. Because I'm, I have may I may have uh, pointed out uh, areas that are outside of Vishakhapatnam district politically, but according to me, uh, I would like to see the landscape as as without any political boundaries. And looking at the landscape, it's always thrilling to go to lots of paths and search for snakes. Being uh, being uh, herping in Wysak for the last fifteen, for the last ten years, I've realized that there is always a new place to find. And I have myself not uh, uh, pointed out or gone to many places in the Ghats, but I've learned from friends again, like some uh, people who have herped here, that there are a lot of places in the Ghats that are really really good to find species of snakes. Uh, some spots and hotspots is just is just a rough figure. This is not a scientific publication, but this is just through personal communications that I have realized that these are some of the spots and ideally some hotspots where you can find a variety of species of snakes. For example, our very own in the heart of the city, the Kambalkonda uh, snake, Kambalkonda Wildlife Sanctuary has over 20 species of snakes. And and if, if you ask me when I was beginning that, 
I would never say I I didn't know that there'll be about twenty species of snakes unless and until we went in the nights, we went in the evenings, we went in the mornings to just to see, just to lift rocks, just to lift logs, just to see uh, if there are more and more snakes. And every time we go there, there was something new that we could add on to our list. Similarly, the Simachalam Hills, Simachalam Hills that is continuously facing threats of uh, urbanization and habitat loss is again another hotspot for uh, snakes in Vizag. I've seen first. I've I myself seen one of the um, like one of my favorite snakes, the bamboo pit viper from Vishak from Simachalam for the first time in my life, and it has lots of other species that are quite uh, fascinating to be seen there, and not just snakes, even reptiles. Aruku ghats, however. Hello. 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 Am I audible? Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, even other parts of uh, Ghats, especially I've, I've heard about, about places like Aruku, Paderu, Anantagiri, Chikavidi, RB Nagar. All these parts in the uh, in the of Aruku and uh, and its neighboring Ghats are extraordinary places to just to explore for reptilian reptilian uh, forms uh, snakes especially and I've, I've i've read papers and uh, publications the 12 years or 20 years a lot of new species were discovered a lot of new species were actually uh, which were never thought to be found in this part of the country were actually present and if we go further south on the east coast to a place called as Kakinada, the Koringa Wildlife Sanctuary, we have a very rare, we have a very unique species of snakes called the spot-tailed pit viper, which is, uh, which is, uh, in fact, uh, not seen from elsewhere. In like this, there are fascinating snakes like this, and of course, there are places like. Beamly, which are uh, which are uh, landing sites for fishes, but what comes with fish are the sea snakes, the very toxic sea snakes that are usually very elusive and not seen to not to be seen in a regular basis. Can be seen in places like landing centers and fishes where they accidentally get caught in uh, nets and trawls and they be brought to the coasts. Uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about something called as the Wizag snakes, which is which is maybe a sort of uh, scientifically incorrect, but uh, but you know some snakes were like Abhijit, Dr. Abhijit was mentioning that when um, when herpetological studies were actually begun in Vizag, there were some snakes that are actually first time described from Vizag. Uh, I'll be just quickly taking you through the uh, snakes. Uh, we have something called as a common trinket that was first described from Vizag in 1803. Uh, it's a it's a very unique snake that has a typical S-shaped uh, striking position. And uh, we have India's smallest snake, the Brahmini blind snake, which is which, which the, the two niles are as small as are, are which can weigh as small as a rice grain. And the, the adults may not grow more than 10 centimeters to 10, 15 centimeters. Again, this was again first time described from Vizag in 1803. We have a very common uh, wolf snake, which is uh, which is black and white in color. Again, seen from Vizag for the first time in 1802, and described from there onwards. And and the uh, the uh, the notorious the uh, the toxic uh, common crate that was uh, that was first described in Vizag, and it's it's still a complex that people all I've been hearing from researchers that common crate that we see in Vizag is different to the rest of the country. I believe that's the same with many other snakes if you sequence them or if you do a DNA-based studies. Uh, there are some sea snakes also. I think I'm just mentioning one. I believe, I believe there are two or three sea snakes that were described from Vizag. One such is dwarf sea snake. Unfortunately, I could never get to see the snake, but I believe that this is one of the snakes that can be found across the uh, east coast or, or even the west coast of India. And and my very favorite, my very favorite, is the, uh, which is the uh, uh, bamboo pit viper, which is uh, which is a very unique snake, very beautiful snake, often found in often found nocturnal in places like where there are trees and bushes and all. And I've I've seen this snake so many times, and every time I see it, it's it's a new 
just has something special to add on to the snakes. And all these snakes that I've just shown you right now are found just in our city. It's not, we don't have to even go far away from any. We can just find almost all of the snakes right in Kambalkonda, in, uh, in the coast, or in Simachalam, and all that. And when we go further beyond this, when we go further to learn more and more snakes, there are hundreds or 300 species of snakes in the, in the country, species of snakes in the country, and about uh, 50, 60 species in, in, in Wysak or in, in and around Wysak. And uh, what he said has talked about king cobras, which are again very elusive animals and uh, fine and with a different behavior to that of their counterparts in Western Guards is unique. What brings this aggression into them or defense mechanism into them is very unique. Uh, to learn more about snakes and, uh, and uh, uh, about snakes in generally, we have a fantastic field guide called the Snakes of India Field Guide by Padma Shri Romulus Pitekar and Akshok Captain. And we have a very own Wysak based initiative that uh, that documents wildlife in wildlife belonging to Wysak called as the biodiversity Wysak dot blog, blog in. You can go to there and also you can see some of the snakes that me and some of my friends have photographed in from Wysak, which might sound astonishing to you. Uh, a, a small uh, reminder about snake rescues in Wysag. Uh, we, we have seen the fantastic uh, presentation from Mr. Murthy about how they have been uh, rescuing and addressing the conflict from uh, on king cobras in and around Wysag. This is a, a similar initiative that uh, the, the local youth from Wysag have taken part and started volunteering for uh, rescue uh, as a rescuer. This was initially, uh, I believe it was initiated back uh, three to four years back when uh, 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 then DF for uh, Alan Sir uh, 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 took, took in some volunteers as rescuers and credited them with uh, identifying cards so that they will, in fact, uh, go about to snake rescue calls and uh, and uh, rescue snakes from houses and from villages and so on. Uh, this was uh, this this then was this this legacy was then continued by uh, Selvam sir and and, and our current uh, DFO, Mr. Anand Shankar. And uh, it's a it's a very good uh, initiative by Forest Department to empower and encourage uh, people to uh, contribute voluntarily towards snake conservation in city where you find number of snakes on a daily basis to be rescued for. Uh, I'm sharing just a gist of numbers for viewers in Wysag who would like to know the numbers of snake rescuers. Uh, uh, these people have rescued over probably 250, 300 snakes in the last, just in the last two years, where they have released the snakes and, uh, and caught the snakes and released them into uh, really ideal habitats. Uh, so what happens when you see a snake in your home? This is again, uh, this is again an interesting question, uh, especially when you have, you know, if there is a rescue when you have called, what you should, what should you do before the rescuer arrives? Are some of the important points are to be calm and maintain distance. Maintain distance is a mandatory rule right now, and regardless of being there a snake or not, but still, uh, it's good to be calm and maintaining distance from the snake. It's good to keep an eye on the snake just to know that where the snake is moving and where it's uh, going about and not to gather around snake because that might panic the snake and it may it may either try to escape from you which in case will might want to try, bite this is not a great idea to gather around snakes uh, if you have any small latch or broken walls or uh, small pipelines try to close them and avoid that snakes don't enter into them. Uh, remove debris if any it's, it just makes the rescuer's job easier if you find that the snake is in one if there is debris blocking the pathway just try to remove them unless uh, without disturbing the snake kindly do not spray any chemicals or boil water on snakes we have we've been seeing this on almost every people are almost ready or have already sprayed some sort of chemicals thinking that snake very torturous for a snake to be thrown a boil, boiling water or chemicals so i, I would say that uh, kindly keep your cool and uh, do not spray anything rescuers will be at your doorstep very soon uh that, that's my presentation i would like to thank uh the ap forest department bishop Putnam division uh, uh the, the conservator of forest mr ram Mohan, sir, and, and uh, the uh the divisional forest officer mr anand shankar and uh own wisex who's curator ma'am dr nandini uh, nandini madam giving me this opportunity and being giving me the opportunity to talk what amongst such uh, uh, stalwarts of, of uh, uh, and of course uh, uh, to my organizations uh, the 
with the bank trust for letting me to uh, 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 talk on their behalf and also wildlife cons a very young wildlife conservation organization that uh, you may want to look up to in the coming day uh, so that's my time uh, you can find you if you ever want to get in touch with me that's my email address and that's my phone number thank you thank you ganeshwar uh, it was a good presentation giving a quite a brief about the snakes of vizag and your work about it thank you very much and keep doing the good work uh, well uh, now we actually intended to have a live session from madras crocodile bank uh, trust where mr ajay karthik is there who is the assistant curator of mcbt and he'll be talking about the big four snakes of india over to dr uh, mr karthik Meanwhile, yeah. Meanwhile, maybe we can take question answers while uh, in Chennai they are having some issue with the internet. So meanwhile, we'll take take some questions. Uh, some interesting questions came up. Uh, maybe Dr. Abhijit, I would like you to uh, talk about it, especially the snakes anti venom, uh, where it could be available. Uh, for different species, is it different? How to use it, and what are the precautions? and uh, the related um uh, well that's the most burning question of uh, um of today and forever so snakes all, all, always uh, equate with the snake bite actually and uh, if you see our country uh, the snake uh, nt snake venoms are getting prepared from the venom collected from almost one place that is Uh, by Irula tribe, there also their contribution of Madras Crop Bank there. So it's a cooperative society which is actually collecting venoms and that is getting distributed to different parts and uh, you know uh, anti for anti venom production. But research recently have shown that uh, there is a geographical differentiation in venom properties because uh, biologically we should be knowing that you know uh, snake venom is mainly evolved for Uh, for food and secondarily used for as a defense mechanism. So, uh, if you see the ge uh, geographically from southern India to northern India and northeast India, the food items that snake is eating they differ. Okay, so the snakes of south in south India should have different venomous venom properties to subdue their prey than the snakes of the northeast India. So geographically, venom properties do differ, and that's why there is a need now to have. you know regional specific anti venom uh, production centers and there is the uh, the role of forest department comes up because uh, you know ultimately snakes are all uh, uh, belongs to our uh, you know uh, forest department the custodian of this resource so there are a lot of proposal often comes up for uh, you know development of such centers in uh, specific areas but then uh i think our forest department is able enough to identify the you know the the best uh te technology and the best people who can able to do this and that is where the call and the collaboration that is needed between scientists between policy makers between managers and also the local people who will be going in the field and collecting the snake for their venom so i think that collaboration is a very important for uh, mitigating snake bite uh, conflict uh, in current situation thank you thank you abhij thank you dr abhijit also i would like you to talk about a bit about the first aid when there is a snake bite or something well uh, 
uh, as rome always says that uh, the the best treatment of uh, snake bite is to rush to a hospital and you know uh, no first aid is probably the best first aid but then uh, you know uh, there are there are places quite interior in our area where most of the snake bites are happening so it is recommended even by world health organization that you know there should not be any uh, time that should be wasted in in doing any kind of uh, treatment in the in the area the snake bite treatment can only happen in hospital and time is a limiting factor in case of snake bite so if somebody is getting bitten by snake there should be effort for you know as soon as possible to rush to hospital so that that can be treated properly and doctors are trained enough to know the symptoms and treat the patient okay thank you dr uh, dr abhijit uh, there is another question with us where uh, somebody is asking like what could be the impact of release of various snakes after this, this uh, after rescue and relocation to an area where it has been released so what is the basically the question is that impact on the release area where the yeah. snake has been released that's a, that's a really pertinent question today because we are trying to save thousands and th thousands of snakes from our country every day they are getting rescued but many of the snakes may be also released far away from their place of rescue that create uh, that creates a problem uh, with uh, you know homing instinct of the snake through research it has been found that snakes have a very very strong homing instinct and also snakes are dependent on their microhabitat to hide and seek prey okay so if you release a snake far away from its uh, home range then the snake will not be able to make out where to hide and where to look for prey so it it may move a long distance and it may create more trouble or more conflict situation so in research it has been seen that smaller snakes largely have less than 1 square kilometer of home range and in case of python it has been seen that python may have a strong homing instinct that may cover almost 7 to 8 square kilometer area so they do have you know larger area as well as very small area but it is also important that you know we if we were rescuing snake with proper methodology we should be able to release them in a place which is not very far from their own original habitat so that is that is something which we may have to ensure yeah thank you dr abhijit uh, there is another interesting question i mean uh, su such pertinent questions are coming that i cannot avoid them uh, like from uh, pointing before you uh, people want to know like what is the difference between the venomous and the non venomous snakes like if you can just point out venomous and non venomous yeah so that's uh, that's how snakes are classified always but as i said it's not that easy to you know distinguish just by a sight but i just want to tell you is that there are two family of snakes which are venomous and they constitute almost all the venomous snakes of our country and these two families of snakes are elapid snakes that have predominant neurotoxic venom and the vipers or viperid snakes which has predominantly hemotoxic venom but viper snakes can largely be identified by their distinctive head shape stout and short body so if somebody is uh, careful enough to see this character they can identify a viper at the same time uh, it's difficult to identify sometime the elapid snakes but then within elapids you have crates you have cobra you have coral snakes and you have uh, sea snakes right right so they have few of the distinctive character which you we probably have tried to have a glimpse of those like great snake which is the most common elapid snake uh, has a narrow bands on their body and co cobra spread a hood which has an imbricate scale so these are the simple character by, by which you can uh, id snake and for that you should read also field guides for identification right thank you thank you very much i think ajay has joined us and yes. uh, we are almost done with our question and answers now i would like to request ajay kartik the assistant curator from madras crocodile bank trust to take over the session
आजे Ajay, you are not audible. I think there is some issue with their net. Oh, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm women. You can carry on. Please tell me. That kind of things we can ignore. Uh, I think we have Ajay live. Uh, I am really sorry about the delays from my end. I am having some severe tech problems. Uh, Vimal, did you manage to receive the videos I sent on mail? Yeah. So basically, I think I am very happy to be a part of this sort of occasion uh, where uh, several speakers have already spoken. I'd like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity. So this was going to be a live demonstration of snakes. And uh, we have some problems with our internet connectivity here, so I preferred that I would be able to shoot it as a video and send. Uh, one of the important things as far as uh, identification of snakes, I'm sure all the other speakers have touched upon this as well, is that India is uh, extremely biodiversity rich as far as uh, snakes go. We have several hundred species, of, I think the current count is close to 320 species. So uh, for most uh, for most cases and in most places, it's not practical for a layperson to be able to precisely identify uh, all 300 of these species. It's practically impossible. And uh, uh, several years ago, uh, Rom Whitaker and uh, other people working on snakes at the time came up with this concept called the Big Four Snake Species. Uh, while that concept is a little bit uh, outdated, because we know that there are several other species of snakes as well uh, that are quite uh, dangerous to human beings. Uh, but most snake bite incidences, and uh, particularly uh, probably in Andhra Pradesh and in Tamil Nadu, almost all snake bite incidences are caused by one of these uh, four snake species. So uh, for the average uh, layperson, it's probably uh, ideal to be able to get a good idea of identifying just uh, these four species of snakes. Uh, rather than uh, all 300 and odd snake species. Because even uh, even in dry places, even in the drier parts of Tamil Nadu and the drier parts of Andhra Pradesh, there are still over 40 snake species that are commonly found. So it's difficult for people to know all of, uh, to be able to precisely identify all of them. But uh, being able to clearly identify just these four species is probably the most beneficial thing for a layperson. Of course, for a herpetologist or somebody who is aspiring to uh, learn about or study about about snakes this option always exists of learning more but uh, in a day-to-day -day situation or for an average person i think being able to identify just these four species uh, is more than enough
so i i'm just going to check if my connection has been fixed again so that i can play the videos from my end because i don't know if vimal has received the videos <laughs> received the videos that i sent him so uh, i hope this is audible now and that i'm my screen is also i'd like to start a presentation i'm sorry i had to do both the phone and the laptop at the same time for it to work uh, so i'll just like to run a brief few slides about about the common snakes i think some of the speakers have already touched on this subject before but just a handful of slides uh, is my screen shared okay uh, uh, yeah so uh, just a brief few slides about uh, some of the common snake species of india and uh, primarily the big four as we talked about after this i can play a few videos of the snakes themselves so uh, these points have been touched upon but uh, snakes are basically scaled reptiles uh, class reptilia order scomata suborder serpentis they are one of the most diverse groups of uh, uh, animals like i already said uh, they range in form and function from uh, tiny under 10 cm burrowing snakes to uh, large heavy body 30 foot 70 to 100 kg long pythons and anacondas so also snakes are poikilothermic which means that they rely primarily on uh their environment to be able to thermoregulate effectively uh and they lack external ears uh this doesn't mean snakes don't have any ears at all the internal ear mechanism is largely largely available still but they don't have external ear openings like we do india has over 300 species nearly 320 at this point 60 of them are venomous uh in tamil nadu as well as probably in andhra pradesh there are about 15 venomous species out of these 60 odd venomous species less than 20 have been documented to cause fatalities so a vast number of our snakes nearly uh, 250 of our snake species are absolutely harmless to human beings uh i'm not going to go through this slide but uh, some uh, simple facts about snakes they all have backbones but lack eyelids external ear openings and limbs and uh, some of the uh, primitive snakes like boas and pythons they have uh, spurs uh, on either side of their cloaca and the remnants of a pelvic girdle so that's the closest snakes come to having legs uh, also they lack eyelids which means that snakes can never close their eyes snake eyes are always open regardless of whether they're sleeping awake alive or dead uh, snakes also shed their skin periodically uh, this is uh, again for uh, for lay people it's a usually a great cause of concern when they see a shed skin somewhere in their society or near their apartment they get very worried but uh, it's a normal thing because uh, it doesn't mean that there is a sudden infestation of snakes that means that uh, one of the resident snakes has simply chosen to shed its skin in a place where you can see uh, as opposed to usually under a bush or near a burrow or something like that uh, snakes flick their tongue and uh, this is primarily to smell uh they have a vomero nasal organ or a jacobson organ which is what helps them decode uh, the scent around their environment and they also have uh their jaws are connected by a pivoting piece of bone called the quadrate bone and uh, their lower jaw is divided in two uh, segments which is only connected by a ligament so this basically what this means is that snakes can consume quite a large sized prey in relation to their body size so this is a russell's viper baby 
uh, dissected from a museum collection which had consumed a rat that weighed uh, 135 percent of its own body weight so it ate a rat that was much larger than itself by mass and uh, larger snakes can do this in more spectacular fashion uh, Indian pythons are often documented seeing uh, small uh, feeding on small spotted deer and um, uh, they can quite easily eat something the size of a stray dog. So it, snakes can eat things that are much larger than themselves. And uh, if snakes are divided on the basis of dentition, there are four large groups of snakes. Uh, so the first group of snakes are the aglyphous snakes, which means that none of their, uh, none of their teeth display any modification for delivery of venom. So the red blotch here is a cross section of the tooth. So they're basically entirely solid tooth snakes. So pythons, anacondas, rat snakes, several of these species are considered to be aglyphous. Uh, Ophistoglyphus or uh, rear fang snakes are also referred to as mildly venomous snakes sometimes, though uh, quite a few rear fang snakes are capable of uh, causing severe, severe envenomation to human beings. Uh, rear fang snakes basically have enlarged fangs right at the back of the mouth. And instead of a uh, aperture like a needle, they usually have grooved rear teeth through which the venom dribbles down into the prey as they swallow. You can see this picture of a green vine snake, a fairly common species. Uh, it's harmless to human beings, but it is a rear fang snake. And as it's swallowing this lizard, you can see the front of the mouth doesn't make any contact with the lizard even whatsoever. All the chewing action is done at the back of the mouth. And that's how they uh, inject prey into their, inject uh, venom into their uh, prey. The two uh, species of snakes that are of great concern in the snake bite issue are proterogryphs, which are also called elapids or fixed fang snakes. As you can see in this uh, uh, cobra here, you can see they have short, permanently erect fangs in the front of the mouth. And the fangs here are covered by small fang sheaths. And the most advanced venomous snakes are the solenoglyphs or the hinged fang snakes, the viperids. Uh, so viperid fangs are basically folded against the roof of the mouth when they're not in use. And when the snake decides to bite something, the fangs uh, uh, spring forward on uh, on movable parts of the uh, of the jaw. So here the snake is being restrained and the fangs are being exposed by a snake handler. Otherwise, the fangs would be uh, normally lined up against the roof of the mouth. Uh, so because of this diversity of venoms, because of the diversity of size, shape and habitat, snakes eat a wide variety of food. Uh, most of them are generalist feeders, which means that they eat things like amphibians, uh, lizards, rodents. Uh, some snakes are very specific in their diet. Uh, king cobras, for example, as they've been already spoken about, primarily eat snakes and monitor lizards. Uh, and there are some snakes that eat only fish because of the nature of their habitat. But broadly speaking, they eat a wide variety of prey depending on what kind of snake it is. So we are just going to talk about the big four common venomous snakes today. And uh, these are the most widely distributed snakes in Andhra Pradesh as well. So the first and probably the most iconic, well-known uh, member of the big four is the spectacle cobra. Uh, spectacle cobras are uh, called so because uh, they have the distinctive uh, U-shaped marking on the, uh, on the back of the neck. Uh, this is true in Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, of course, but in parts of Central and uh, West India, you have... Spectacle cobra is in a completely uh, dark colored form of the spectacle cobra. And uh, they are well recognizable by their, by their defensive posture. Though a normal a cobra that's going about its own business will very rarely spread a hood. Uh, this is only when they are threatened. So the snake that's posing beautifully for the photo here is only standing like that because there's somebody in front of it. Otherwise, the snake would not stand like that. When they're moving around normally, they don't spread a hood. And uh, the other common... Uh, Elapid or the other common elapid in uh, Andhra Pradesh would be the common crate. Uh, I believe it's called Katlapambu in Telugu. Telugu. And uh, the common crate is a nocturnal snake. Uh, unlike the spectacle cobra, which can grow to be about uh, 1.8 meters long, maybe a little longer. And cobras can weigh up to 2, 2.5 kilos. Crates are much more uh, slender bodied snakes. And we'll discuss their taxonomic characteristic. Uh, you'll see that in the video as well. You can see they have very distinct uh, enlarged hexagonal vertebral scales or the scales along the spine. So that's what helps to differentiate them from other associated snake species. The two common vipers of the area would be the saw scale viper, which is a very small snake in relation to the rest of the big four. 
Uh, Cobra's crates can grow over five feet long, uh, likewise with the Russell's Viper. Uh, but saw scale vipers typically remain under 60 centimeters long. And uh, they are quite easily distinguishable visually for the layperson because they're short, stout snakes. They're sh- and they typically have an arrow, arrowhead marking on the head. And uh, this, is, this posture is their typical defensive display. When they feel threatened, they uh, sit in this uh, semicircular motion and uh, perform this behavior called stridulation which means that they uh, rub their scales against each other to create a small hissing noise. I think the origin of the behavior is to reduce moisture loss. And Russell's Viper is probably one of the most distinctive looking snakes in India, even though it's commonly confused with uh, other species. So I'll play a few short videos right now that I manage to take with each of these snakes. And the first video is with the common trait. The sound of the video, Ajay. One second, ma'am. Is the sound working now? Actually, you need to unmute yourself on the computer because you're playing it through the computer. Okay. Uh, I'm having some issues with the video. Nyaneshwar, the unmute isn't working on the computer. So I'll just continue with the talk really quickly and uh, possibly Vimal can play the videos after. After. Okay, great. So, uh, common crates are, uh, like I said, they're a nocturnal uh, elapid and very common in most parts of uh, most parts of South India. They're a very distinctive looking species, and uh, there are many non-venomous snakes that mimic their appearance. But uh, this uh, the snake that you're seeing on the screen right now is a typical looking common crate uh, in the sense that it's dark. Their typical coloration is uh, dark brown or uh, uh, glossy black and uh, dark glossy, glossy brown or black. And they typically tend to have uh, these thin white bands along the second half of the body. Uh, I'm giving very simple uh, identification characteristics and not really entering into taxonomy because this is aimed for people who don't really know what snakes are. So uh, they are a thin snake. They're only about the thickness of an adult person's thumb. This snake, for example, weighs only about 250 grams, despite being four feet long. And uh, they can quite easily be identified by these white uh, stripes on the second half of their body and a head that is not very distinct or large as compared to the rest of the body as well. Uh, Crates move around in the night and uh, one of the things about crates is that their bites are almost completely painless because like I said, they have very short fixed fangs in the front of the mouth and the key identification characteristic actually for a common crate uh, is the vertebral scales. You can't see it, but on the next video, I have the snake closer up. Uh, uh, What uh, differentiates crates from their uh, non-venomous lookalikes? is basically how uh, enlarged and distinct their vertebral scales are. They have ivory colored bellies like that, as you can see. And the vertebral scales, which are where my thumb is pointing to right now, are uh, hexagonal shaped and enlarged. And that's the only way to differentiate them from uh, other lookalike species, uh, like the wolf snake, which is also a mimic of the common crate and uh, superficially resembles a common crate, even though wolf snakes don't get as large as adult common crates. But in areas where uh, snakes are common, uh, it's a good idea to pay or treat any small black and white snake with caution because these vertebral scales and uh, things like the L'Oreal scale are all uh, features that herpetologists can observe from uh, herpetologists can observe from uh, restrained snakes such as this or uh, 
preserved museum specimens but uh, on a live snake these characteristics are difficult to observe so broadly speaking any snake that's black and white is meant to be treated with caution because very likely that it is a a common crate and uh, this is the average size of a common crate this is a full grown snake they're not uh, extremely large snakes uh, they max out at about 120 to 150 cm long and as you can see uh, they are only as about as thick as a adult human being's thumb uh, they uh, uh, they are usually a very mild mannered snake and not very prone to bite but they do have a tendency of biting people uh, that are sleeping uh, at home that's probably because maybe we smell like food to them but just so you have a size comparison uh, i have a short i'm pausing the video here snake is about 120 cm long weighs only 300 grams and uh, toxicity wise is one of the deadliest snakes uh, in the country they have a very potent neurotoxic venom and their bites often cause uh, stomach cramps initially uh, followed by vomiting paralysis and uh, without uh, being put on mechanical respiration people often die uh, without uh, mechanical respiration or treatment from brain uh, the second species is the russell's viper uh, the russell's viper again uh, is uh, one of the species that's very distinctive as far as people who have any awareness about snakes go uh, they have a very clear uh, pattern on the body. You can see it as the snake moves away as well. They have a series of uh, chain-like patterns down the middle of the spine and on either side of the body. And this is the average size Russell's viper, which means that the species grows up to uh, maybe uh, four to five feet long, usually sometimes a little bit larger than that, but typically four to five feet long. And uh, they often uh, they often get confused for pythons. They are often mistaken for pythons because Russell's vipers are also a bit stout and heavy bodied. But uh, the pattern of pythons is very unclear and it's a very random uh, pattern. Whereas Russell's vipers, regardless of which part of the country they are seen in, uh, this chain like marking uh, exists right along the backbone and on both sides of the body. It's for this reason that they are also called uh, chain vipers. In Sri Lanka, they are called chain vipers, and that's an easy way to remember that. Uh, they have large triangular shaped head and a very distinctive chain like pattern along the body regardless of where they are observed in India. Uh, so the another thing about snakes is that I had mentioned that snakes don't have eyelids. So the Russell's viper that you saw in the video had actually just shed its skin today. And uh, uh, some of the key characteristics on the skin you can see here. One thing is that they don't have eyelids. Instead, they have something that looks like a contact lens. So they have a clear scale on top of the eye. So the clear scale on top of the eye is basically protects the eye from uh, dirt and debris, maybe while they're foraging or hunting for food. And uh, when snakes are about to shed their skin, the eyes usually turn uh, milky white or bluish in color. So this is because snakes secrete, uh, secrete a secretion between the old and the new layer of skin that helps the old layer peel off easily. And when that secretion goes over this clear scale, it sort of makes it appear cloudy in color. So the snakes eventually absorb that secretion and within five to seven days, they usually shed their skin. Uh, so this is uh, these, it, I just felt like pointing out because we had a fresh shed skin from, from that specimen. And uh, again, because we have access to a shed skin, uh, you can see the pattern very clearly, even on the shed skin, the shed skin, the pattern transfers from wipers onto the shed skin and you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. It's a chain like pattern that goes all the way along the spine and either side of the body. Uh, so it's a very clear and uh, clear cut way to be able to identify the species. And uh, oftentimes what happens, especially people with a little bit of knowledge about snakes and a little bit of understanding about snakes have often uh, picked up and handled uh, Russell's vipers, assuming that they were pythons and uh, the same thing as uh, the same thing has happened to us actually at the crocodile bank as well uh, people have uh, people have bought uh, uh, russell's vipers they found on the road in a gunny sack and picked up and somehow said sir we found this python we don't know what to do with it and uh, luckily for them it was a time when the snake was perhaps sluggish or didn't want to bite because uh, they picked it up with their bare hands without restraining the snake put it into a gunny sack and thankfully the snake never ended up biting them uh, so uh, that's, I'm going to wind up my talk here because I'm having a lot of technical issues and I'd really like to thank everybody for your extensive patience. And uh, next time, uh, uh, if we do such a thing, I'll ensure that these technical issues are ironed out beforehand since we are in a remote part of the 
uh, remote part of the city our internet is often troublesome and i like to thank all of you and to the other speakers as well for patiently putting up with my uh, technical nonsense for so long thank you mr karthik uh, it was indeed a, a beautiful presentation with all those uh, enchanting four beauty which are the big four definitely for india so thank you very much although some technical glitches but it uh, it went well thank you very much so we are almost done with our uh, all the presentations and all the speakers have spoken as well as we are done with the question and answers almost all the questions have been covered up so i think i would now hand over to my conservator of forest uh, shri p ramon rao sir for uh, his closing remarks good evening everybody it's a wonderful day to celebrate this uh, world snake day madam has organized a very beautiful uh, webinar this is the first time to participate with me so for this uh, our pcf has uh, given opening remarks even though he is very busy and he is agreed for giving opening remarks he has participated for, uh, almost to the end of the session and then uh, unfortunately we could not get this vertex uh, uh, video because of some technical problem youtube mm -hmm. okay then uh, abjid das has given detailed description about the snakes we are very thankful to abjid das ji then kelan murthy garu has given wonderful uh, note about the king cobra in andhra pradesh so i have also seen number of king cobras in uh, ni was uh, dfo vijayanagaram near mokwa area very thankful to kelan muthu garu and nyaneshwar he has done very good work in vishakhapatnam he has seen number of species in uh, species of snakes in vishakhapatnam wonderful presentation he has given and finally kartik ji kartik ji has given clear cut identification of crates so how to identify and he has given the shaded this thing so very thankful to all of you we had a very full day very good trip and also i thank uh, mr srimati nandini salaria and his and her team having organized this uh, webinar in a successful manner thank you very much so thank you everyone all the speakers out there as well as senior officers from head office our pccf officer ccf high life sir rahul pandey sir and all of the senior officers who have attended from uh, there all the participants who have seen the youtube live streaming posed some questions we have tried to answer them uh, dr abhijit kartik kelan murthy gyaneshwar everybody and uh, our special guest uh, mr rom vitaker who could not be live but yeah his message went through to all so thank you very much it was our first attempt at uh, doing or hosting a webinar we will certainly do more of such kind of webinars and uh, with less of technical glitches of course but yeah that of course comes along with the system so thank you one and all thank you very much thank you